started, and I'm not going to get that. Can you hear me without the microphone, please? Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> okay, good. Yes. Absolutely. So welcome to this uh, intimate gathering on behalf of Crossroads Cultural Center. Uh, my name is Rose Tomasi, and I will be moderating our discussion this evening. Um, in our age, political analysis is often based on what has been called sociologism, the idea that people's choices and behaviors can be explained uh, by their social circumstances, by the group they belong to, and so on. In practice, this means that we tend to assign people to certain large, oversimplified categories um, and groups and reduce the richness of their experiences and struggles to various abstractions, which invariably reflect our own ideological biases. We are fortunate tonight to have with us journalist Daniel Allett and filmmaker Jordan Allett, who are in the midst of a four-year reporting project that monitors the pulse of the Trump presidency from nine key counties. The beauty of what they are doing comes from the fact that this project consciously breaks free from the sociologistic trap. It chooses to look at people and their communities as real human agents whose actions are shaped by their unique experiences, ideas, and desires. By doing so, they show us the true face of America during the Trump administration, and they help us break through the ideological polarization that has been rightly decried as the great scourge of today's political life. Before embarking on Trump's America, Daniel Allett, a graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Georgetown University's Public Policy Institute, was the Washington Examiner's uh, deputy commentary editor. Before joining the Examiner, he was a National Review Institute Washington Fellow and a senior writer at American Values, a Washington, D.C.-based public policy nonprofit. He has also written for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Politico, USA Today, National Review, and dozens of other publications. Jordan Allett is the founder of In Altum Productions and a media advisor to In Defense of Christians. Jordan has filmed projects in over 25 countries, from China and Syria to Nigeria and Cuba, with themes ranging from international human rights and American politics to Catholic spirituality. Jordan and his work have been seen on Fox News, EWTN, and CNN International. He received a BA in political science, philosophy, and film from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So thank you for coming, and we hope you enjoy our event this evening. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. Um, something remarkable happened recently that you may have heard about. Uh, the New York Times published an anonymous op-ed by a senior member of the Trump administration. And this author revealed the existence of what he called a quiet resistance movement inside the administration, whose goal is to support parts of the president's agenda and what he called his worst inclinations. Uh, this author called President Trump amoral, anti-democratic, erratic, ineffective, uninformed, among other things. The op-ed, as you might expect, dominated the news for a week or two. It's still being talked about. But the most remarkable thing about the op-ed, not it wasn't that it was written or even what it alleges about President Trump, but how it was received among Trump supporters. A poll found that uh, three quarters of Trump supporters didn't uh, believe the op-ed. They thought it was fake news. We, we posted the op-ed uh, on our Into Trump's America Facebook page, which is populated mainly by uh, really ardent Trump supporters. And we found that, uh, and we asked people for their, for their thoughts about it. And all the responses were along the lines of fake news. Mm -hmm. Or there were a few that said, hey, this is more proof that we need to drain the swamp and you know, fight back against the deep state. Um, I've been in Macomb County, Michigan for a month, for the last month, um, which is one of our counties. Uh, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a flip county that went from Obama to Trump. And uh, I've been talking to Trump supporters there. And I remember last weekend I had dinner with uh, two sisters who are both Trump supporters. And they both, after I asked them about the, the op-ed, they, they both uh, were convinced that the New York Times had written the op-ed themselves and that it was you know, as I say, fake news. So I think response to that op-ed kind of demonstrates a central theme, an emerging theme for our project, which is a loss of trust between the public and the media. But, but it's bigger than that. It's a loss of trust between uh, the 
public and many of our institutions. So if you look at polling, confidence in, it's not just the media, it's the political parties, government, the church, uh, labor unions, corporations, law enforcement, everything but the military basically has gone down in recent years. And I think to understand the Trump phenomenon, we need to understand that central point, which is the, uh, the, the bond of trust between the, uh, the public and the institutions that are the lifeblood of our democracy has been broken. And it's tempting to say that Trump is uh, the cause of this, but, and I think in some ways he uh, exacerbates the problem, but it predates Trump by many years, if not decades. And I think we should see the Trump phenomenon in some ways as an effect or a consequence or a symptom of this larger problem. Now for us, uh, Into Trump's America is our attempt to better understand the people and places that put Trump into the White House. So last March, a few weeks after the inauguration, we picked nine counties in nine different states that were pivotal for Trump in, in terms of winning the election uh, or important to understanding the Trump phenomenon. So five of the counties are flip counties. They voted for Obama and then went to Trump. Two of the counties are uh, historically Republican, more conservative, and then two of the counties, Orange County, California, and Salt Lake County, Utah, flipped the other way. They voted for Mitt Romney in 2012, and then they went to Hillary. Um, and so where, uh, since last June, I've been traveling full-time among these counties, spending a lot of time with people, meeting people organically, not just Trump voters, basically anyone who'll talk to me, and interviewing them repeatedly, so there's sort of an, a longitudinal element to it where I talked to somebody last March, talked to him this year, and then we're measuring how their views may change over time. And so Jordan uh, has joined me for parts of, of the journey. Um, we're telling stories in, in articles, um, through uh, videos, photography, we're doing some stuff on social media. And by the end, by 2020, um, I'll be writing a book and we'll be doing a documentary film uh, with a core group of people that we've been following. And our ultimate goal isn't just to try to explain why Trump won in 2016 or predict what might happen in 2020, but to, to dig deeper, to get to the values, the priorities that people have, and then again to kind of measure how their, these people, how their circumstances may change over time, how their priorities may change, even their values over the course of Trump's first term in office. So we'd like to share with you a few of the things that we found so far in the first year and a half. And we have a few short videos and a couple of photos to share that can maybe give you a better idea of the people that we're meeting. Um, <clears throat> so who, who uh, voted for Donald Trump? I'm not asking you guys, but I'm saying who, <laughs> who voted or now who still supports Donald Trump? It's sort of this uh, caricature of the Donald Trump supporter or voter um, and then I think there's a reality that's a little bit different than that. It's much more complicated and nuanced. Um, so the, the, the caricature, usually constructed by, by people who don't agree with him or the media or his political opponents, is of a person who is um, white, male, uh, working class, uh, high school educated. And of course, a lot of those the people that fit that description voted for him, and a lot of people that fit that description didn't. Um, but there's also, I think, like I said, a more complicated, sort of diverse coalition of, of support that, that Trump was able to sort of cobble together. Um, so this caricature, I think, uh, would, would often say that a Trump supporter, a Trump voter, would be anti-woman, right? Especially running against her, Hillary Clinton. But a, as many of you might know, Trump actually won white women by 10 percentage points. So that, that goes against what, what a lot of people would have assumed. Um, a lot of people think, you know, this caricature of a, of a Trump supporter or voter would be anti-Hispanic, but, but Trump actually did better than Mitt Romney um, with Hispanics in 2016. Uh, the caricature of a Trump supporter might be bigoted or, or racist, um, but actually about 200 counties flipped from supporting Barack Obama in 2012 to supporting Donald Trump in 2016. So 
did all those people all of a sudden, you know, did that area become more bigoted in that in that time period? Or perhaps the priorities um, that these people were focused on were different than what, for example, the media uh, has been telling us. Now, not only did a lot of counties flip, but a lot, we've met a lot of people who are what you might call Obama-Trump voters. So people who voted for, for and supported Barack Obama and then voted for, for Trump. And, you know, most journalists in D.C., they just can't, they just can't fathom that, that idea at all. Um, and, I, and I knew that those people existed, but I, I've, I've always been surprised at how many people uh, did vote that way. And oftentimes I found that, you know, somebody who, who doesn't vote might not be that up to date on the news or what's going on. Somebody who votes sort of the same way every time in a presidential election, oh, I'm, I'm a Republican, I'm going to vote for Republican, Democrat, Democrat. But somebody who switches around a bit, they tend to, even if I don't agree with them, they, they, they tend to know what's going on. They tend to have a reason for it and be able to articulate that. Um, and so I, there's one example of an individual, and of course we've met many, Mark Locklear. Uh, Mark Locklear is a 50-something small business owner in Robinson County, North Carolina. And Robinson County is uh, it, it's the poorest county of the 100 counties in North Carolina, and it's also the most racially diverse rural county in the whole country. And 70% uh, of the population is, is uh, minorities and it's sort of a um, tri-racial county so a third of the population more or less is african-american a third is native american including mark who's part of the lumbee tribe and a third is white caucasian um, and they they supported uh, barack obama in 2012 but then they swung to donald trump in 2016. now how often have we heard that that story of the most diverse racially diverse rural county in the, in the whole country supporting Donald Trump in the media. We'll get to the media later, but, um, you know, Mark, Mark Locklear wasn't only a supporter of, of Obama's, but if you look in the picture, what, what do you see over his shoulder? You see a bobblehead of Obama. <laughs> you, see, you see the framed picture of the, the Obama family next to his. I mean, he, was, he really liked Obama, and then he swung to Trump over Hillary. Um, and sort of unpacking that is a big part of our project, I think. Uh, and it really goes, again, against conventional wisdom or this caricature of what a Trump supporter is. And we found that there are a lot of Mark Locklears around the country who voted for, for Trump for a lot of different, um, a lot of different reasons. So I, I really believe that you know, there is this sort of diverse coalition that, that Trump was able to cobble together in different places. Uh, and I think more than anything, there's a lot of reasons for, for this, but the, I think the, the biggest thing that journalists especially, but those in politics, especially in D.C., having lived there now for 15 years, but having lived also in Wisconsin and upstate New York, Hawaii, some other places, is that people tend to be less ideological than we, we assume that they are. So, and it makes sense, right? So if you're maybe a young person, you move to D.C. because most people, a lot of people aren't from D.C., they move there. Maybe they go to work in politics as a staff or as a journalist for an NGO, for a think tank. Um, their, their political opinions are very important to them. They have strong opinions. And oftentimes, their affiliation to a party is also really a big part of their identity. Um, and the longer you stay in DC, the stronger you're almost forced, depending on the job, obviously, that's sort of reinforced. And you, you're kind of pushed into the mainstream of a particular party or a viewpoint. But, you know, and obviously people in different parts of the country have strong opinions. Everybody has strong opinions. And they have uh, party affiliations uh, as well. But certain things will supersede that. So especially when it comes to economic issues. Um, and then the economic issues will often then uh, affect social issues. So um, for example, in, in Robinson County, manufacturing and, and, and jobs leaving because of uh, trade deals, that was a big issue there. And, you know, as, a, as somebody who is in, in D.C., I need to always remember that and remind people that because so many of the jobs in D.C. are uh, connected to the federal government, I mean, the federal government is not going to go bankrupt, for better or worse. It's not going to move overseas to get uh, cheaper labor. But when you live in, especially in a rural area, when one manufacturing business leaving can devastate a community. All of a sudden, unemployment goes up, crime goes up, drug use goes up, the schools are worse off, people don't want to move there. I mean, it just, you know, over the course of 
a generation, it can really uh, you know, have a, a negative impact. And, and so that would cause somebody to say, you know what, maybe I'm going to look at somebody that I haven't often thought of because they're in a different party or, or, or somebody who uh, might turn me off in other ways but are, are with me and with my community. Um, and in fact, in Robinson County, we, uh, we sat down with a gentleman named Philip Stevens, and he was actually a, a Democrat for a lot of his life, and then uh, became a Republican and is a member of the Republican Party in, in Robinson County. Um, and he sort of described why many people, Democrats, but also Republicans, supported Trump, not only in the general election, but also in the primary, when there are other Republican candidates. And I think, again, he's going to point to some of the trade deals and how that would affect their community. And by the way, the videos are, because of some audio problems, they're a bit out of sync with uh, the video and the audio, but you'll, you'll figure it out. So when Donald Trump made this statement, it was very profound. He says, you guys passed NAFTA, and that's supposed to be free trade. But it's not free trade if it's only free one way. And that one statement resonated with citizens here regardless of their uh, ideology, regardless of uh, their party affiliation, because that went transcended ideology. This was economy, which was even more important. So just as the caricature of the, of the Trump voter supporter, I think, is not entirely true, I think that the caricature that the, the media creates of what Trump represents to people is often not all that accurate either. Um, and so we, we found that out just talking to people and what, what they thought he represented, and especially right after the election, but even, even now. So we started to, whenever we would interview somebody in one of these counties, whether they were a member of Congress, whether they were unemployed looking for a job, whether they're a Democrat, Republican, voted for Trump, didn't, we asked them to, uh, in one word, sum up why Donald Trump won that, that particular county. And it was interesting, so we, we, we strung a lot of them, or all of them together, the first three or four counties we went to, into a montage. And I'll play that video now, but it's interesting to hear the words that are being used, again, by people across the, the political spectrum. Non-politician. Confusion. Excitement. Hurricane Matthew. Hope. Change. Hope. Change. Hope. Hope. Change. Change. Supreme Court. Optics. Frustration. Manufacturing. International trade. Jobs. Ill. Discontent. Trust. <laughs> Leadership. Media. Hillary. Economics. Fearless. Conservative. Politics. Difference. Non-politician. Non-politician. All right, well, hope and change. Who knew? <laughs> I think that explains perhaps partly how he was able to win nearly 10 million Obama voters. Um, again, the, you know, the, the conventional wisdom about Trump, he was the candidate of fear and, and uh, you know, doom and gloom. But uh, for a lot of people, he represented hope and change. Um, and that sense of hope um, explains, I think, why he was able to, why he resonated so much with the working class and, and, and in rural areas. Uh, he tapped into this idea of the forgotten man, forgotten woman. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, that idea. But um, these are people who have long felt ignored by both political parties, sort of looked down upon by the culture, let down by our institutions, um, and you know, we found this especially true in rural areas. People resent that all the decisions are being made in the power centers, in the state capital, or the university towns, or you know, the federal capital in Washington, and that they weren't getting any say in it. They they had to pay taxes. Their businesses had to abide by the regulations, uh, but they weren't seeing any of the benefits of these decisions. Um, so they feel taken for granted and. Uh, it really struck me in talking with a lot of farmers. I, I did some pieces on uh, the tariff, the trade tariffs, over the summer. So I talked to a lot of farmers, Wisconsin and Iowa. And I, I did sense a little bit of resentment about just the disconnect or, or a lack of appreciation for the work that they do. And that it dawned upon me, 
and meeting with them and then people in manufacturing, I don't know what the hell they do. You know, like, I, I have no idea what goes on on the farm. And we're so disconnected now in our, with the, the sorting, the great sort, as they call it. You know, people, they move to the, to the coast, so maybe they have a white collar job, and they don't get onto a farm ever again in their whole lives. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people, they don't know how to farm, they don't know anyone who farms, and they don't know anyone who knows anyone who's been a farmer. So we're so disconnected. All I know is I go to the store, I buy food, I go to a restaurant, I eat it, I order something on Amazon, and somehow it, you know, gets produced, and it shows up on my doorstep the next morning. Do we ever, how much do we think about how that process and all the hard work that goes into producing that stuff and then delivering it to us? And I think people who are in those trades, they, there is a little bit of resentment because they know that it's, it is hard work and there's a lot of skill involved. Um, and so, again, people in, in rural areas felt like they weren't getting the respect and the resources that they deserve and that nobody was listening to them. And Hillary, you know, she demonstrated that she wasn't really listening. She didn't campaign in these areas. She didn't uh, really include their priorities in her agenda. And she, she seemed to kind of talk down to a lot of people. And I think that became more apparent after the election in her book and when she gave interviews. She kind of revealed how she really thought of some of these voters. And some of these areas, too, are, again, these are, Obama did really well. So it wasn't necessar necessarily a political ideological thing. But we have a little clip of her sort of revealing how she really feels. This is, some, this is after... After, this is only a month or two ago, I think. Yeah, pretty recent. In India, by the way, she's given a talk in India. Uh, yeah. If you look at the map of the United States, there's all that red in the middle where Trump won. Now, I win the coast, I win you know, Illinois, Minnesota, places like that. But what the map doesn't show you is that I won the places that represent two-thirds of America's gross domestic product. So I won the places that are optimistic, diverse, dynamic, moving forward, and his whole campaign, Make America Great Again, was looking backwards. You know, you didn't like black people getting rights, you don't like women, you know, getting jobs, you don't want to, you know, see that Indian American succeeding more than you are. Whatever your problem is, I'm going to solve it. Well. At least we know how she really feels. <laughs> um, so that's how she saw a lot of these places, stagnant, pessimistic, not contributing enough, and the people who live there as, as, as racist and bigoted. Um, and, you know, we can't be surprised that she didn't win in those places. Um, and so along comes Donald Trump. You have a billionaire from Manhattan who's always in a suit. He's got soft hands, as they say. <laughs> and how did he appeal to people who live a much different life and work in a much different way? And it wasn't, he didn't try to pander to them by putting on, you know, a flannel shirt and overalls and jumping on a tractor as, poli you know, politicians are expected to do that kind of thing, right? We see it at every election. He didn't try to do that. But what he did, he showed up, number one, and he campaigned those big rallies uh, that, you know, oftentimes were only covered in terms of the violence that sometimes happened. But they were, Jordan's going to talk a little bit more about them because they continue to, he continues to hold these rallies. And that was, a, that was really... Uh, a good move for him and he he told them that they matter he said you know you're right you should be upset you're not getting your fair share um, and uh, I recognize you I'm listening to you and and so you know he acknowledged their work is vital he didn't say you know he said we're gonna you know renegotiate trade deals we're gonna bring jobs back but he didn't say I'm gonna give you handouts there's one thing I know and it's been reinforced in, in going to these places. People want to work. They want to put in a hard day's work. They want a decent wage for a hard day's work. And so he said, I'm not going to give you handouts. I'm going to, your, your work is vital to making America great again. And so um, people love that. And, you know, it's, uh, again, it showed he was listening. Jordan mentioned Robinson County with all the manufacturing job losses. Uh, NAFTA was really the, the end of it for them 25 years ago. Of course, Hillary's husband signed that into law. And the fact that he was able to come in and take a very sort of unorthodox position on trade, so both parties for a long time have been all about free trade for the most part. And that was 
you know, the inside the beltway, the conventional wisdom on that, on that issue. The fact that he was not a politician, you know, a lot of people felt, well, yeah, he can take a different, he's taking a different view of this issue because he's not from D.C., he's not being talked to by the lobbyists, he doesn't care. Um, and so, again, he, he just showed that he was listening to the people that were being hurt the most by this and not to other politicians and the lobbyists and the interest groups. Um, I think we have a, a little video here. Uh, yeah. Um, well, actually, I'll, I have one quote from a farmer. I met a lot of farmers in June, um, but one in particular, one family, a family farm in Trempolo County, Wisconsin, which is uh, another one of like 20 counties that went from Obama to Trump in Wisconsin, in western Wisconsin, along the Mississippi. Uh, and this family, uh, they have, uh, you know, exotic pet, uh, exotic animals. They have, I think, some dairy, some crops. And they, the, the woman, uh, Noelle, she had voted for Obama twice, and then she flipped to Trump. And she said, quote, I definitely feel like Trump made rural people feel listened to and that we were important. And then her husband, Henry, said, he, uh, referring to Trump, acknowledged that we, were, that we uh, were here. Trump said, we love our farmers. He understands that farms are businesses. That's why farmers voted for him. He thinks a little bit like we do. And, you know, again, that, 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 it's that idea that he cultivated a sense of belonging a sense of solidarity, a sense of purpose. And those aren't commonly words associated with Trump, but for, for the people who voted for him, for many of them, that's what he did represent. We have one more little uh, clip here of a young man named Jared. He's also a member of the Lumbee uh, Indian tribe talking about the importance of being recognized by, by leaders. I'm not going to go over there to tell to come down and say, okay, what can we do for you on that? How can we address your concern and needs? You know, with us, it's not that you're going to pass some kind of massive legislation or, you know, commit a $100 million government funding, but that you listen to it. That you'll say, you know what, they want to leave that important. They're as important as people in Silicon Valley, they're as important as people in, in New York City, they're important. That's all, that's all we want. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, they, they, they uh, you know, a lot of people just feel like they're, they're, they're not being recognized. And also, a, a point that we've heard over and over is, they feel like the culture is really kind of mocking them. You know, whenever you hear an accent or somebody from a certain area, it's, it's you know, people are, it's, it's sort of the other in a sense. And, and they feel like, um, whether it's not just the media or the news media, but it's um, the entertainment industry, uh, you know, late night talk show hosts, they're always the butt of the joke and they're, they're, they're seen as, as uh, again, as, as the other and they want to be recognized as, as equal to anybody else in their communities to be looked at in the same way. Um, last, last summer, uh, going back to Trempolo, Dan and I were, were traveling there, uh, Trempolo, Wisconsin, and we called State Senator Kathy Beinhau, who's a Democrat, um, and we called her office and she was very excited to talk to us and to meet, meet with us because she, after the election, and, and like the country um, you know, supporting Trump, the, the county did swing from Obama to, to Trump, and she was, like many, kind of confused by that. Um, and so she took what, what she told us, to, she called it a sort of journey of, of understanding, um, investigating what, you know, why people voted the way that they did, and um, something was sort of revealed to her during that, that journey. Um, and it's something that, that, again, we have another short video that I think that it hasn't gotten a lot of attention, either right after the election or even now, almost two years later. A mm, couple days after the election, I started a journey of trying to figure out what happened. And I talked with the election judges, which are all, all the elections are run locally in, in Wisconsin. I talked with the county clerks, so they work with all the municipal and town judges all of them in, around my district, I, taught, I looked at ward level data. And then I sat in Whitehall, the county seat in Trepolo County, 
in the courthouse and I physically counted new voter registrations. I counted 1,666 new voter registrations, which is roughly about 12% of the total vote in 2016 in, in, in the county, in Trumbull County. And I found, for example, in the city of Whitehall, of the people who went to the polls in 2016, 24% of them were new voters. And this was a story nobody was telling around the state or around the country. And I started doing more research and looking around the state at what the patterns were. And I realized the story nobody's telling is that there are two different sets of people that came to the polls in 2012 and came to the polls in 2016. And what Trump did was motivate people who had never, in many cases, never been motivated before. And the beauty of physically counting the new voter applications is that I learned about the people as I turned the page looking at each one of the applications because they were required to have their birth date, they were required to show some type of ID, and that ID was written down. They sometimes even added their email address, but they didn't have to. And I could tell where what their address were, was. And I could also see um, that you would never see, in, unless you actually looked at the applications, that people voted in family groups. That there were groups of people from an area that had never registered before, they came together to register. It's really interesting because, you know, conventional wisdom is that if, if somebody's, you know, registered as a Democrat, they're going to vote for a Democrat most, most often, and same with the Republicans. And so as a, as a candidate, especially in a hotly contested national election, you, you got to focus on, on, on the, the swing vote, the moderates, um, the independents, the people that maybe you can convince to come to your side. Um, but you know, we know that at least half the people out there don't vote at all, and and Trump was like she said, like Senator Vinehout said, was able to motivate those people um, when they weren't motivated previously. But not, even going back to to uh, when when George W. Bush was in office, it was the same same thing. So how did he motivate them? Well, Dan talked about um, uh, sort of building trust with those communities, and I think he did that through solidarity, but. One, one way that he built solidarity was through proximity. So by showing up, either himself or others, or just having, um, you know, having, I guess, a, a presence in certain communities. And we talked to a lot of Democrats, including, you know, mayors and, and members of Congress and, and state senators and whatnot, who were very disappointed that, that Clinton didn't show up. And, and they said, you know, look, it, it was noticed by not only um, Democrats, but by independents, and uh, it really hurt her. Um, and, he, and he did show up, and he's continuing to show up to, to rallies, and it, that really does sort of underscore the, how, how important that was for him, because he knows it'll probably be important in, in the future. Um, so these rallies, right, uh, we've all heard about them, and um, we, we sat down with a woman, Rachel Gooder, who's a business owner in Howard County, Iowa, which uh, actually is the county that swung the most from uh, 2012 to 2016. So they had supported Obama by about 20 percentage points, and then they swung 20 the other way, 21 the other way. So it's a 41 point swing, biggest win. Um, it's a rural county, I think about 100,000 people, and uh, sorry, 10,000 people. It's mainly white, like 98%. They, they, they're very low unemployment. Um, like I said, very rural. But we, we sat down with, with Rachel and talked about, she had just come back about two or three days before that from, from a rally and asked her, you know, what it meant to her. And uh, we were a little bit surprised about, you know, how enthusiastic she was. I thought it was exceptional. I was thoroughly impressed with the way it was, first of all, the way he put it on, and um, what Trump said. He was so down to earth, and didn't, he didn't talk over people's heads. You know, he just talked straight English, and was just, I was just thrilled. I thought it was really good. I have so much respect, more respect for him than what I did before, by just hearing what he's gone through, and what he wants to do for us, and 
and he was so easy going. You know, it was like it was almost like he was talking to us and not giving a speech. You know, because he would crack some jokes and he was just so relaxed and just I loved it. I that was probably one of the best things I've done. It'll be it's one of the highlights of my life. Just going to that and being a part of it and, and watching how people are, reacted to what he was saying. It was just. It, it gave me shivers. It was just really, really cool. So, quick, quick aside. You know, Rachel and, and, and her husband. I mean, they, these are people that worked really hard and have a very successful business. They've traveled all around the world. They're educated. And so, when she said, "This is one of the highlights of my life," I thought, "Wow, that really stood out to me." Uh, I was very, very surprised. And her son was sitting next to her, so I didn't ask her if that was more uh, important than giving birth. But um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Clearly, Trump was able to cultivate a sense of solidarity, feeling of belonging among a lot of people. Now, when taken to the extreme, I think that can become a problem. And when, when America's institutions are weak and trust is lacking, a tribal mentality can take over, which I think a lot of people would agree has, that's happened here in America, in our politics. And tribalism, I'm defining it as loyalty to one's own group above all else, including sometimes the truth. And one feature of the tribal mentality is that you have to believe the worst of those who are not in your tribe. Um, you know, it doesn't allow for nuance. Uh, it forces you to make kind of zero-sum assessments of issues or people. And so in the Trump era, often on both sides, you see that Trump is all good or he's all bad. And increasingly, when I interview people, um, if I talk to a Trump supporter, I always say, okay, you love, you love him. Give me one thing you don't like, one, thing, one mistake that he's made. And then if, if I'm talking to a Trump critic, I say, you know, is there anything redeeming about him? You know, is there anything he's done well? And that's often the time in the conversation where there's like a 30 second, you know, nobody's talking, they're just sitting there thinking. Uh, and they, they can't think of it. And I think that's really concerning. <laughs> um, Except for the, now, even his supporters will say, one critique they'll have is to say, well, maybe he should lay off the, the uh, Twitter for a bit. Yeah, that is actually, that is. <laughs> Almost everybody mentions that. Yes. That um, but uh, I met one woman who was, sort of personifies that, that mentality <clears throat> to the extreme. She's 41 years old, her name is Carla single mother um, in Iowa, and she had uh, voted for Obama in 2008 and be quickly became disillusioned uh, because uh, you know, she felt Obama wasn't really bipartisan and that he apologized too much for America whenever he went abroad. And then when Trump came on the scene, she, she embraced him right away. And when I talked to her in July, she said, you know, I love the man uh, and everything about him. And part of her, for, for Carla, part of her uh, sort of how she defines her tribalism, if you will, is that she, she needs to shun her old tribe completely. And so for her, that means believing the worst, uh, you know, things that have ever been said about Obama, which incidentally Trump uh, helped advance, which is that he wasn't eligible to become president because he was born in Kenya, and. He's actually Muslim, and that he uh, is in bed with uh, terrorists. And she actually believes this as a former Obama voter. But with that tribal mentality, you have to completely disavow your old tribe and completely embrace your new tribe. So I, I, I'm always bantering with people like, "Come on, let's. I mean, yeah, he's great, but let's. We can agree that he's these personal attacks are, you know, they're a bit outlandish." And, Maybe you shouldn't do that. And she, you know, it was really hard for her to admit anything. She would go, well, yeah, yeah I guess, well, but the media, they go after Barron Trump. Remember that time the media went after uh, Donald Trump's son? And so, fine, but anyway, they, there, there was no allowing for any kind of nuance in assessing the president. Um, and again, you know, it's, it's that mentality that kind of requires a complete loyalty. Uh, and I was in. I mentioned I was in Macomb County. Uh, last week I went to a Republican meeting for the Macomb County and um, it, it was kind of a contentious meeting. Uh, people were upset because 
things weren't looking good for the Republicans. But at one point, somebody got up and was like, look, we just need to, Donald Trump has done only good for, for this country. Um, we, need to, we need to come together to fight the Democrats who are Bolsheviks, fascists, and enemies of the Constitution. And nothing that was said that night got a, more of an applause than that line. Mm -hmm. And I hear that again and again on both sides, that, that, that word fascist. And sure, you can argue it all day long, and you know there might be some sort of point you can make, but it's not very helpful. Uh, and so, you know, the, the shunning of people who don't, who are not in your tribe, you see it in the way even you know Trump administration officials are treated. Right? They're they're getting harassed in public. They're not being allowed to speak. They're um, not being allowed to eat at restaurants. And uh, you know, and I've seen more and more people disengaging from one another, disengaging from friends, family members who think differently. And I met a guy uh, who, who said that he uses Trump as a filter when deciding whether or not to be friends with somebody. He said something like, you know, if you come at me with that Trump shit, uh, I don't think I want to be your friend. Uh, and then I talked to a woman who had fallen out. She was in tears nearly when she was talking to me about falling out with her friends because they were just so unflinchingly pro-Trump. and. And, and she was really upset by that. So it's really taken a toll on people. Um, one major finding, which won't come as a surprise to anyone, among the hundreds of people I've talked to, I haven't found, I should say I found very, very little movement in terms of support for Trump. So I, I, I haven't met anyone who voted one way and says, I, re I regret voting that way, or I'm gonna re vote for the other party next time. And for the most part, people's views have stayed exactly where they were two years ago, and they've become more deeply entrenched. So if they were sort of maybe reluctant to support Trump, now they're all in. Or if they sort of like Trump, but they ended up not voting, now they disavow him completely. Um, and the polls show that. He has historically high approval ratings among Republicans, between 85 and 90 percent throughout his first term, and historically low approval ratings among Democrats between 7 and 10%. Um, so it's getting more polarized. Um, and part of that is because he's doing he's pursuing the agenda he promised, right? He's, he's accomplishing parts of it. He's, you know, Supreme Court, conservative Supreme Court justices, uh, renegotiating trade deals, tried to repeal Obamacare, tax reform, so, the, you know, immigration. So he's, he's, pursue he's, he's doing what he said. And he's acting the same way he acted in the campaign, right? There were people who said, oh, he's going to get more presidential. Uh, he's going to, you know, grow in office. But if you remember, he never said that. <laughs> he never said he would. And he hasn't. And, you know, you could probably argue he's gotten worse. But he's pretty much who he thought he was. And frankly, in some ways, it's kind of refreshing. And especially, again, going back to some of those Obama voters who felt like he, they were let down by him. At least with Trump, you can't really be let down. We knew who he was. So... You know, and there's a new a poll I just saw, 60% of people uh, said that there's, uh, who didn't support, who don't support Trump, said there's nothing he could do to win their support. And a majority of people who voted for him or support him said that there's nothing he could do to lose their support. Now, part of it, being a journalist, I'm looking at nothing, <laughs> and taking that literally, and maybe a lot of people don't take that literally, but... It's kind of scary <laughs> on both sides. And another thing, you know, we're going to talk a bit more about, you know, what pe attracted people to Trump, but just to put it quickly, you know, some people were drawn to him because of his stances on, on issues, um, but a lot of people were attracted to his, his personality, his approach to politics, his status as an outsider, and more and more people are. Uh, in fact, that there's a poll uh, by the Pew Research Center in August that found that, that by a three-to-one margin, Trump supporters were now embracing his personality over his policy positions. And I found it, maybe you have too, you know, people I know, uh, people who lead public policy groups and nonprofits, I see it in the language changing, even pundits. A lot of people who are pro-Trump, they're taking on the language of, of sort of the extreme rhetoric a lot of people that begrudgingly supported him. Yeah. Are now, yeah, they're, they're just, they're all in on him. Uh, maybe I, like there is a cult of personality surrounding him, and I think there was around Obama too. But, um, 
so really he can do no wrong among some people. And a lot of people ask me if I think Trump is vulnerable to a primary challenger in 2020. And I think that, you know, uh, there might be a Republican who will run against him. But make no mistake, the Republican Party is Trump's party. He's fully taken it over. And not just in the polls, people I talk to, but if you look at congressional races, when he, you know, you look at people who, who have criticized him, Republicans, they're generally either losing, like Mark Sanford in South Carolina, or they're, they're, they're retiring because they don't want to face Trump anymore, like Jeff Flake and Bob Corker. John McCain died. So um, looking ahead to, you know, after the midterms, the Republican Party is going to be even more the Trump Party. And you look at his influence. Um, when he endorses somebody, they win, generally. I think 35 out of 37 primary contests. In Florida recently, um, a, kind of a backbench congressman, Ron DeSantis, ran for governor in the primary. He was way behind. Then Trump endorsed him. He shot up in the polls the next day and never looked back, and now he's a nominee. Um, and so really, tr Trump has taken over. Um, so I wanted to kind of get back to this idea of the country, just quickly, uh, losing trust in different institutions. And just focus a bit on the, on the media, because I think really they're the sort of first ones in, in, in line when it comes to a lack of trust. Um, I saw, you, you guys might have seen this video that's gone out about a week ago uh, of the Weather Channel reporter. Has anybody seen that one? Yeah. Where, and it's just an example, but I think it underscores the point, where um, the Weather Channel had this reporter in, I think, Wilmington, North Carolina, and he's reporting uh, from, you know, about, about the hurricane, Hurricane Florence. And he's sitting there with, you know, he's completely covered in, in rain gear from head to toe and he's sort of trying to brace himself and it's like he's going to get blown over and he's talking to the camera like this is going to be the end of the world type of thing and there's these two teenage boys strolling by in t-shirts and shorts in the background like nothing's going on <laughs> and the cameraman i appreciate this but he you know he zooms in quickly to kind of crop it out. <laughs> these two kids walking by but you know the thought is man if the weather channel has to produce fake news and it, you know but it, I mean it's not fake it's at least exaggerated news and of course they you know it's probably because they want attention and they want clicks and they want people watching them and and you know it's all about money too um, but you know that I think really you know it's funny but it really does you know make you wonder how often this type of thing does does happen uh, a Pew poll indicated that trust in, uh, in the news media has gone down about 20 percent over the last 20 years from 53 to 32 percent and the Hill uh, newspaper recently reported that 72 percent of people believe that news outlets uh, regularly report false or misleading news. Now you know a lot of people would say well you know with the rise of the internet um, you know that brought about websites that aren't reputable and fake news and all of that. Um, but I, I feel like, especially somebody who, who tends to be more conservative, that that mistrust in the media, um, it goes back many, many decades. And uh, it's not just always about fake news or um, exaggerating the news. It's also about ignoring stories. It's about, you know, and, and typically for what we think is a political agenda. Um, and I think every community has their, their own examples of this. But I, I know for myself, you know, I think a lot of people who are more conservative, uh, they all have this, this point in their life when they realize, wow, the media is really biased. Um, for me, it was, I remember as a, a college student going to, to Washington from Wisconsin for something called the March for Life, where people come together and usually they have, a, you know, hundreds of thousands of people go there every year and and it, it was a pro-life march from the Capitol to the Supreme Court and I remember coming back to Wisconsin and, and looking at the newspaper that had come out the day after and I couldn't find a word about it and then but on page two they had this whole story with a picture about a protest in Florida that eight people were protesting some business about something I don't even know what it was about and I thought wow okay you know, they're not going to report on this because they feel like if it's out of sight, out of mind, then sort of this, this view of, of people actually going to this type of protest or march or gathering is going to become, you know, not as popular. 
And so I feel like a lot of, a lot of people have that mistrust, not only in fake news or exaggerated news, but in, in news stories that are ignored, um, or, and then also communities that are, that are often ignored as well. Um, you know, and th again, this goes back, it goes back a long time. Uh, I think in the, it was 1990, so this is, you know, pre-internet. Uh, the Washington Post polled its own, like 50 of its own editors and writers and con contributors, uh, and they found out that 49 of the 50 were registered Democrats. And then the one that wasn't was a sports writer. Uh, Tony Kornheiser, if anybody's a sports fan. But, uh, and, and actually, he only he is a Democrat, but he, his wife uh, registered, or, yeah, registered as a, as a Democrat, and he registered as a Republican so they could get both the mailings. So really, it was 50 out of 50. Um, I think they stopped polling their people after that. And, they, and they, oftentimes now they tell their, their people just to, to claim that they're an independent, so it doesn't look as bad. But those, those numbers, I mean, I, I've seen polls more up to date that, um, and the reason I mentioned 1990s, this goes back a, a long time. And so there's this sort of like decades old mistrust among conservatives and even moderates and people who are oftentimes are Democrats. But like in North Carolina, you talk to the Democrats there, they're socially, they're, they're conservative. <laughs> okay, they're, they're not the Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer progressive uh, Democrats. Um, and so, you know, they feel like they're, the things that are important to their community, um, oftentimes it is, you know, having to do with spirituality, with faith, and other things, and just their, their own community are not really being represented um, in, in the media, and, and the stories aren't represented there. Um, now, you know, it's, it's, you know, speaking of the Washington Post article, or, or poll, it's no wonder that they didn't anticipate the rise of Donald Trump when all your colleagues, and, and, and your friends are thinking the same way you do, more or less, then, you know, how can you think outside of that, outside of that bubble? Um, I often say that, you know, if you're a journalist and you are either reporting or commenting on uh, national politics or what's going on in the country and you don't know somebody that voted for Donald Trump, you know, that's a you problem. <laughs> you know, and, and the same will be true for the other side because it's 50-50. And you, 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 sh you feel obligated to get to know, you don't have to agree with them, you don't have to love them. <laughs> um, it'd be great if you can like them, but it'd be, it'd be great if th they're around. Because I've, I've been to events where journalists talk about these things and they, they just can't fathom anybody or anybody they know supporting somebody like that. Um, and, and I think that's a big problem in the media. So obviously, um, Trump exploits this and he adds to this distrust with this very combative uh, relationship um, that he has with, with the media. And, and people will say, well, it's, it, his, his combative nature is, is a threat to the First Amendment, but then there are others who would say basically, well, it's about time. Um, and, and they feel like he's finally sort of articulating, however he does, uh, this frustration that a lot of people have with uh, the media. Um, and uh, you know, additionally, when Trump speaks, and, the media and then his, his supporters and those that voted for him, they hear different things. So we, we heard uh, America First from Hillary Clinton and, uh, you know, when Trump came out with that slogan, American, America First, all the mainstream media uh, reminded the public that it harkened back to the 1940 election and the movement to keep America out of World War II and then somehow connected it to Trump uh, being sympathetic to the Nazis. Okay, now his supporters heard it very differently. Um, they heard it as simply the idea that, like maybe their member of Congress putting their, putting their area above a, you know, another area, that their president would represent them first, or America first, and then have the consideration of others after that. Um, here's a picture of uh, an individual we, we, we talked to in Erie, Pennsylvania, another, another flip county, Erie County, Alan Uwanek, and he, he lost his job shortly before Trump's election um, he was laid off from his job helping to manufacture trains at uh, GE Transportation in, in Erie, which is the largest employer there, uh, or was. He said, and he had, a, he had a very very insightful quote, he said, when you're in manufacturing basically your whole life, and you're watching company after company after company leave, and that was one of the reasons I voted for Trump, I won't say it's protectionism. It's just the way he said, you know what, our country comes first. And a lot of people don't like that attitude, but when your country is struggling, 
you've got to start looking at bettering your own country. It's time to take care of our country. Um, now that, that, that's a great, you know, insightful quote. Um, it's something that I think a lot of people got behind. Um, but, you know, while Trump has shed light, I think, on media bias, he's also sort of conflated media bias with, with the idea of fake news. And it's, it's really to the point where anybody that disagrees with him is not telling the truth, and anybody who doesn't tell the truth never tells the truth. And he, he had a very upfront quote that I'd like to end this with, and he said, he was uh, being interviewed by Leslie Stahl uh, from 60 Minutes, and this was actually during his campaign, he, um, and she asked him why he always attacked the media, why he always attacked the press, and he said, I do it to discredit you all and demean you all, so when you write negative stories about me, no one will believe you. <laughs> um, maybe we should take questions. Yeah. Um, we do that a bit. If anyone has any questions, well, I think you raise your hand first. Um, thank you very much for the presentation, which um, definitely hit home for me in many ways. Um, I guess I I totally agree with your focus on the media, which I think is a big part of this whole phenomenon and terribly irresponsible in many ways. Um, and, um, but I, and I think part of the, when you were talking about tribalism and fragmentation, I think part of that is intensified by the media because there's a, a kind of systematic refusal to understand or take seriously anything Trump says or his supporters, so therefore it, part, it hardens in the way that you're talking about. Um, but I think that, and I think that the media, as you're saying, is sort of closed in on itself and as a, in a kind of echo chamber, and there's an exclusion of many positions. I wonder if it's really a, a in a, in a, lib, a pro, I wonder if it's really democratic or if that's the right word because it's, to me, or, or left wing in its bias, to me it seems like, I don't, I don't know what you would say, cosmopolitan, uh, urban liberal, uh, sort of bias, smugness, and self-enclosure. Um, but as, I mean, as you were pointing out, there are any number of positions which are reasonable and which people want to hear articulated, which are excluded from the discourse of both parties in the mainstream and the media, like modifying trade agreements. Um, which is, it used to be before 1970, a leftist thing more than a, a rightist thing. Um, and then the other thing which I wanted to ask you about, which you didn't mention, was um, I know that, I mean, I think I saw this in Wisconsin, that several counties went hard for Trump who had uh, large numbers of military casualties. And, uh, and he did make a lot of noise about being less uh, militaristic or less interventionistic, and that was a big under, undercurrent of the America First thing, which I think mm -hmm. a lot of people found attractive and now are disappointed by. Um, and I, I say this also because I follow foreign policy carefully and I always go to the military blogs because former officers, that's where you can find what they think and they often are experts and many of them were for Trump precisely because they thought that he was less of an interventionist than Hillary. That's another thing that's excluded totally from the media. I mean, that, 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 this idea that, that there could be a rapprochement with Russia or that Trump could negotiate with North Korea, these are also just verboten, excluded in the way that you're talking about. So the, the media bubble is, it's, it's, I think it's, it's, it's worse than just being left-wing or anti-Republican. It's, it's a total hardened enclosure which excludes yeah. so much of reality. Yeah, and also it's geographic. Joe was talking about, you know, yeah very few conservatives on staffs of major publications, outlets, especially those on the coasts, that um, claim to speak for the whole country. Um, it's, they need to, and I do have like, I'm developing themes for a book and, you know, what, 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 can, what should happen in order for us to get past this moment in, in history? And I think one thing is newsrooms need to diversify, but not just ideologically, geographically. So if you're, you know, the paper of record and you're um, selling papers all over the, the country, how about bringing people on staff who maybe grew up in, in, you know, the Rust Belt or the Heartland or the South, 
Uh, maybe not as many because if you're the New York Times, you know, you're going to have probably more people who uh, grew up in on the East Coast. But I think that's important because in order to get a full picture of the whole, you need people with different vantage points. Okay, and so that that's a really important thing. Um, on the the military issue, just uh, among the I'm trying to think among the all the military people that I've been keeping in touch with, they're all pretty happy. Um, I just talked to one guy who was uh, an Obama uh, Trump voter who was a sailor, uh, retired sailor, um, and he. <laughs> I went into an interview last week with him, and his friend had told me that he thinks he's weakening and that he may not back Trump anymore. So I asked him. He said, "No, no, no. I think you know I'm still on board." And and he he actually is one who has a nuanced view, but he said the VA. He's happy, and all he, he said, "Look, when I went to the VA." In 2012, 2013, 14, I, I was complaining the whole time. And now he goes and it's a pleasure. He's just like, that's all I know. It's better. Correlation, causation, who knows? But it's doing better. Trump said he'd make it better. And now, and it is from, you know, for, from his point of view, his experience. So, um, and I think a lot of people, <laughs> because the bar was set pretty low in terms of, you know, Trump and foreign policy and, Oh, he hasn't gotten us into World War III? Well, that's pretty good. <laughs> you know? But, but, but a lot of people I know who are uh, not supporters of his, um, a lot of these people, you know, tend to have not grown up in the U.S., um, but are good friends of mine. They're, they're always, you know, they're saying, like, well, you know, we got to live for today because with Trump in office, you know, it could be the end of the world. Like, they really been, you know, they really almost believe that, whether it's North, North Korea, because he is very erratic, right? And so we, they don't know what to expect. A lot of his supporters, though, they say, look, we need somebody, <laughs> if, we, if you're dealing with North Korea, you're dealing with Assad in Syria, you, you need somebody who is not going to, I mean, diplomacy is, is great, but we, we, we need somebody who's going to be tough. And I remember um, it was maybe the first month or two that he was in office uh, that he, that we bombed a couple of Russian jets in Syria. And that really sent a message. I don't think it killed anybody, but people kind of kind of assumed that he was going to be somewhat um, lay off of, of of Assad. And some of his actions there have kind of sent a message that, look, don't assume anything. And if you think that I'm capable of anything, maybe that will be the deterrent for you. I'm not saying that's the best foreign policy, but and, and, and but also like when we we're just talking with with, with people that in, in these different places. Foreign policy is an issue, but it's not usually the one that, that, that comes up, you know, uh, it, it really rarely comes up, I, I think, foreign policy issues. And people generally don't, don't vote uh, based on that. Um, but it, it is interesting to watch how, how Trump deals with, uh, you know, different international issues. Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. I, um, I was very interesting when you brought to the table this um, the, the issue of this uh, tribal way of thinking, uh, because um, you know I'm not from the U.S. and I've seen the same thing uh, almost everywhere in the world. Uh, that happened in the United Kingdom, uh, happened in Italy, mm -hmm. is happening in other institutions like within the Catholic Church, uh, the Muslims in Saudi Arabia, and so forth. Um, so it's why do you think as a society nowadays there is this kind of crave to belong to a tribe? What, what are the factors that originate? It's the default. I think the tribe is like the original. Like that's the default. When other, inst when, you know, again, when all these institutions are suffer suffering and, and not providing what they should be, the church is not, you know, doing well broadly speaking. Um, and there is that lack of trust. What do we go back to? We go back to our people that matter the most. And we become insular, and and that's I think the default position for for most people in most societies. Uh, why does which happen so rapidly? Like you know, people that belong to a completely different tribe are so ready to flip to another. Oh, you mean with some of the people we've met? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think I think with Trump there was a lot of pent up uh, frustration that he uh, tapped into, and so like with the woman I mentioned, right? Who complete you know Obama to Trump and. I mean, I think that it took her years, right? So she was disillusioned, and Trump wasn't even around for, for, I think she voted for Romney or something, and then 
and then Trump came along, and she, she, she didn't even, like, she tapped into something she didn't even know was there, perhaps. And, uh, but, yeah, I, I, I think it'll get worse in the, in the short term, but hopefully better, you know, looking, like, after Trump. Uh, I, I'm pretty optimistic about it. Yeah, um, I just want to say what you're doing is so essential. It's shocking to me how little of it is done. Yeah. I mean, no one is going out there and, talk, and, and engaging with reality. I mean, as a Catholic, as a Christian, I mean, that's part of our, the whole metaphysic is to, and, and especially with Crossroads, is to engage with reality rather than abstraction. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the satisfaction with the media. It's, I mean, journalism, I mean, I started out in journalism before I went to the business side of publishing. The old rules of sourcing, they're, they're dead. It's mostly commentary. Yeah. And that's why even though I someplace, something like Vice Media, which I disagree with, I appreciate what they do, because at least they go, and rather than hearing about the far right in Europe, you'll see 20 minutes with Aragon or Marie Le Pen, or even you know, with the Charlottesville issue. Yeah. So, I mean, um, so what you're doing is really essential. But one question related to this is this phenomenon is happening around the world. But around the world, whether in England or in France or Hungary, it's parties. Here, it's just Trump. I mean, I don't see anybody else. You know, I think that explains why, you know, people stick with him despite all these horrors. Because there isn't, I can't name one single politician mm -hmm. that puts together what the, the pillars of his position of, on immigration and on trade, on foreign policy, and also his hardline stance against political correctness, which the Republicans from Paul Ryan, whatever, yeah. you know, they would cave. So I think that's, you know, part yeah, of his appeal. But yeah. there's nobody. So what happens when he's gone? I know. That's, that's, that's and what happens to all that pent up energy? Is think, it just flow around? Tried, you saw a little bit with Obama, I, I would argue. Um, not to the extent that you have with Trump. Um, and uh, after, after, after Trump, that, that is. He's not interested because in organizing, right? I would thought, you know, no one is organizing his people other than the Republican Party, right? But That's when the real, I think, civil war within the, the Republican Party will take place for the heart and soul, of it, you know? Because, again, I, I mentioned, the, look at the polling and just talking to people, like, a lot of his uh, support is due to his personality and style, and so you can't replicate that. He is a once-in-a-lifetime kind of but thing. He's an he's a unique, unique guy, right? Yeah. Whereas, like, you know, Paul Ryan, oh, that's agenda, Mitt Romney, though. the same guy. Yeah, I mean, um, it is a coherent... <laughs> Difference. But there's also, I mean, maybe it's not directly answering your question, but have you heard of the Obama theory of Trump? Which is David Axelrod wrote an op-ed in the New York Times after the election saying, look, without Bush, we don't get Obama. Without Obama, we don't get Trump. And without Trump, we don't get somebody who's completely different in style and substance. So like, Bush was a cowboy, he wasn't well-spoken, so we got somebody who was thoughtful and going to be respected. And then we had eight years of that, and it's like, yeah, it's all right, but we need somebody who's completely different. And so we got somebody who's completely different. And now it's sort of swinging, careening back and forth. And so I'm, I'm look, looking, oh, Bernie said, I don't know who, who would come. I mean, actually, Bernie and Trump are similar in some ways. But who, if we're going to keep swinging back and forth to the extremes, But that would be a out. twist on what's happening internationally, because you go from Brexit now to maybe Corbyn. You know, so right. brothers, right or left-wing populism, that will be a constant of what form it takes could vary. Yeah, I can't understand yeah. Trump without thinking about Corbyn and Sanders. I mean, yeah. they're very different appeal and very, very different groups, but a similar hysteri hysterical response, denial yeah. from the mainstream, and attraction of people from outside. Trump but also look at their similarities, too. I mean, I've met a few Bernie Sanders supporters who either voted Trump or ended up, you know, sort of liking him but not voting or whatever. And, you know, they're both people who speak you know, the every man's language. Um, they take similar positions on trade and, and a few things, and they're railing against the establishment and the corporations. And, and so that was something in common, and, you know, really tapped into, you know, a hunger that people had there. But yeah, I guess we'll see. It should be exciting. <laughs> you did a very fine job with the presentation. I felt that you touched upon class very well, because many are saying that Trump rules the power because the, those in the Midwest, those in rural areas, were not listening to by the establishment. But how do you answer those that the division or the animus that Trump's creating is also racial? Because in the mainstream press, some will say, and forgive the term, there's a white anxiety in the nation that white people felt that 
eight years of the Obama administration undermine their place in the nation and the world. Now you have Trump who is stereotyped as the white working man's candidate and he's speaking their language, but those on the, the minority is thinking, okay, he's speaking their language, but he's also threatening every institution of democracy, law and order, um, um, trial, so on and so forth. So how do we reconcile the two? Because I feel that at the end of the day, building off this point, it becomes a battle of metaphysics and what is our first principles? Either mm -hmm. you're telling the truth or there are alternative facts. I think, I mean, one, a, a lot of people, you know, I'll just think of like Howard County, for example, Howard County, which is 98% white. And they had voted for Obama and by a big margin and then Trump. I'm not going to say race is not an issue, but it's, I think it's, it's an issue that we see more, you know, obviously if to, for minorities, you know, racial minorities, it is a bigger issue, but when you're around 98% of white people, but then the media, you know, then it's, you know, looking at, and you're focused on, on the issues in your community, then those, is, those other issues are not going to be a priority. And oftentimes I think those, uh, you know, I, mean, I even do it, but we might look at that community as all as one group of people. And, you know, as, as somebody who's been in the Middle East a lot, it's like us looking at Muslims as all the same. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and just assuming, well, you know, Assad and, and ISIS, are they, they're the same, right? Like, no, <laughs> not, not at all. And, and, and not understanding, you know, this, this, the tapestry of, of you know, the, all these differences within, whether it's a religion or, or, or a group of people. Like, they have a lot of things that divide them in Howard County. Race isn't one of them. Um, so, I, I mean, that's just one example I bring up, sure, Dan has, mm -hmm. has, has more. I mean, we, there's Trumpelo County, too, which was interesting because, um, and, and you might know the stats better, but they've had an influx of, of uh, Hispanics over the last... 15 years? Yeah, they, they've, yeah, it's strange. His, Arcadia, which is the biggest city, uh, the only big city, 2,000 people in Trempolo County, uh, it's the share of the population that is Hispanic has grown from 2% to 35% in 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have a Ashley Furniture is headquartered there, and they have a chicken factory. So they, basically, these immigrants have saved the town. They, it wouldn't exist, and you talk to like I talked to the principal and some teachers and the mayor, and they're they're really happy because they they're getting like extensions built on the school and and but it was covered by a lot of people in the media as if oh it went from Obama to Trump this influx of immigration okay these people are unhappy with all these immigrants but you go there and you talk to people and it's actually not really the case I mean people are pretty happy with them coming in and, and well the influx started long before that it started during you know, Obama's first term, and before that even. So you would have seen that. Not that that's not a variable potentially, but not, you know, again, the media saying, oh, okay, you know, they're voted for Trump because they're racist and don't like immigrants. Okay, next county. <laughs> that's, analyze it, uh, you know, one by one. Um, now, uh, you know, Macomb, I don't even want to talk about Daryl um, there, but... Uh, it's really hard to... It's really... I struggle with the race issue and how people, how important it is to people. I think it, a lot of it does have to do with priorities. So, and when you're insulated from what is happening in a different community, you may not, you know, seem to care as much. It's just, um, a lot of people you meet, you know, I, I'll, I'll talk to a Trump voter and I'll say, you know, a lot of people say he's the most racially divisive president we have. No, 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 Obama was the worst on that issue. They'll, and they mean it. And so, uh, and they can, you know, they'll bring up a couple of points. Remember when he, uh, you know, he said the policeman acted stupidly, you know, they bring that one incident all the time. And so I think a lot of it too is when you're not around other people, and this is what it comes down to, if you're not engaging with people who are different than you, you're not going to fully understand or appreciate their problems. It's not just engaging on a, a, a superficial level, it means having a friend, somebody you love and admire and trust in other ways. So that way you're continuing to go back and you disagree and keep having those conversations. And that's really what it takes. I mean, I, I, in my own life, I know that's what's worked for me. I don't, that probably doesn't answer your question, but. Yes and no, but um, this is an issue that goes unfortunately to the very foundation of the nation that yeah. maybe another generation will wrestle with how do the issues of race and class shape us? Um, and now on top of this immigration. 
Yeah, no, and I think um, one thing I want to do is, is ask uh, some of the people that we spent the most time with, you know, one question and ask them to answer it in, in, you know, in a minute or two, right? And then ask all these different people from different parts of the country, different races and backgrounds and everything, and political affiliations, whatever. And then, you know, we, we want to bring these people together uh, in a couple of years and sort of have a weekend together, face to face, not over social media or something, and, I'll, and, and kind of replay their answers and say, look, you know, race and Trump, give me a minute, right? And then read the answers back and have them sort of hopefully in a very positive, uh, understanding way, like kind of debate it out. And, but I know, I think I know what, what would happen is people have just very different, um, you know, perspectives on, on things and they pick and choose. And, and I think when, when oftentimes if you will allow for, for example, um, e even we see this a lot on, on the Facebook page with not necessarily with, with race, but with any issue, it's just people are so polarized and they won't give an inch. And, and then I, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll go to other, and I, uh, other Facebook pages and I'll, and I'll see things and people are just, it's, it's all zero sum and it's like, they won't admit, you know, like, like you said, you know, can you admit that there is a, a history, like even just saying a history of racism in this country, you know, that, that that's at the foundation, you know. Um, Those old Democrats. Yeah, like, you know, can you admit that? Like, that's kind of like factual. And then somebody else will say, well, everything you need to know about the United States uh, is, is looked at through the prism of slavery. Well, that might be a simplified way of looking at things, too, because there's some people who just don't have that experience. It doesn't mean it doesn't, you know, it wouldn't, doesn't have, play a big role in, in, in the history of the country. But um, people are looking at, at things from very different perspectives. And I think a little bit of empathy is huge. Um, but sometimes you just need to hear it from somebody. And hopefully not on social media, because when I've, when I've seen that, it's, 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 it's a rock fight then. Um, because people can't understand you know, sarcasm, nuance, anything in, when you're just typing something. Um, but when you're face to face, it's, it's a lot easier to have those discussions. And, and, and we're not having them. A couple of questions yeah. concerning uh, your work, um, particularly the last uh, issue that uh, you mentioned, polarization. How do you think you can avoid being labeled uh, a priority for, for, for your work uh, as a pro-Trump or against Trump? Oh, and the second obvious question is, who do you think would be interested in listening to what you have done? Well, the first question, uh, that's been the biggest challenge we've had is, and I'll tell you just quickly, like, last year we uh, were sponsored by the Washington Examiner, um, and we started out with, the, with the, the title Trump's America. And I didn't mean it, I wanted it to be completely objective, but I thought this is sort of America in the age of Trump, right? Um, just like Obama's America. And yeah, it seemed right, but then we're... No corporation that we went to for sponsorship wanted to touch it because of the Trump name. It was that toxic even right after the inauguration. So we changed the name to the Race to 2020, which is not as, it doesn't really capture the essence as well. It doesn't it jump out at you. And then when we went independent in January, um, I changed it back to Trump's America. And again, nobody wanted to touch it. And, and our Facebook page was all populated, but it was, our ads were being, people were liking it because they were pro-Trump. They thought it was like a, tr a pro-Trump site. And so it kind of became that because you are sort of who your followers are. And I didn't want, I was so frustrated. So then we, we have recently changed it to into Trump's America uh, because, you know, the act of going in and, and trying to learn. And a lot of these places, they're not like the most pro-Trump counties. A lot of them are, you know, sort of purple counties and stuff. So it's been a challenge. And people, uh, I, we, we hope that one you read our, my writing and watch some of the videos that you'll come away saying, I don't know where these guys stand. And I, and, and I think it helps that we're both somewhat sympathetic to both sides. And we know people on both sides. We've lived all over the country. So we kind of, we, we, it's hard to place where we, where we come down. But it has been a challenge. What was uh, your second question? Who would be your audience? Who well, do you think it would be interested in digging into more deeply into the issues? 
Uh, we, we're trying to offer a glimpse of some places that maybe haven't gotten enough attention. And so, um, again, on social media, we'd like to have a dialogue, ideally, to have you know, a big group of people on both sides and where they can actually debate, have a civil discourse. Maybe that's asking too much. Um, I'd like people in, in the power centers to be able to, 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 to get to know uh, some of the people that we're, that we're following. Um, but, uh, but yeah, really across the spectrum. I know that's not a, a great answer, but we, we want, generally the idea is to reintroduce America to Americans. And, you know, like, who knew that, I didn't know there was this tri you know, Native American tribe in North Carolina that, you know, they have their issues talking to them, it's very fascinating. Macomb County, that, that state, what, what turned the election uh, in that state, Trump won it by just a slim margin. Macomb County provided the, the margin of victory. The Chaldeans, which are Christian, uh, Iraqi Christians, they all voted for Trump based on some promises he had made and, and Pence on things going on in Iraq. And they all swung from Obama to Trump. And that proved uh, pivotal and crucial for, for that state. Who knew these local issues, these, these groups that are, that, are, that are there? I would think Democrats would want it to know what's going on in these areas that they've lost. Yeah, what they you know. <laughs> like, okay, these guys are going to figure out what these people are, you know, what they care about so that, you know, we don't have to. <laughs> yeah, and so, well, it's, it's, it's like, oh, okay, well, so if NAFTA's, you know, the big issue there, then that's not necessarily change what we believe on it, but let's address that. Um, it has nothing to do that, you know, a lot of people too, even if they're very, at least after the election, a lot of people, maybe less, you know, it's what Dan said, less so now, but they, they said, look, I don't like it, you know, Trump in, in some ways, but I like him on, on, on the issues that are important to me. And so um, I, I think that, that those who oppose Trump need to maybe not focus on him, but focus on those that he was able to convince to vote for him. Because um, I, I think some of them would, in the long run, swing back to them if they focus less on him focus more on you know their challenges in their particular uh, particular towns and cities. Just a question. I mean, uh, first of all, I'm very, very grateful for uh, what you're doing because it's so refreshing tonight for me. Uh, because your attitude is precisely this interest to know more <laughs> what's going on before anything else, and then it gets through. But I just wanted to understand from your experience, because when I came here, of course, I'm Italian. 25 years ago, I was struck by two things. One, how strong the American identity was when I came, and how big the country is. And I had this thought the first time I flew to San Francisco, six and a half hours of plane. And then I was there, and I said, wow, Washington is really, really far. And I flew. Think about a hundred years earlier, you know, when you take two months. And yet, you have a sense that you are in the same country. What keeps these people together? Now, listening and watching and observing, it seems that this thing, I could easily say the opposite. What makes America one again, in a certain way? Because it seems that such polarization is much more more prof is almost not knowing each other. Hmm. Not you, you said. He said, "I don't know the farmer. I don't know." I mean, it's yeah. it's as if, in a certain way, you know it. Even 50 years ago, probably you didn't know it if you were in New York. Mm -hmm. But that was not a problem. Now, instead, it seems that there's so much disconnect, not only from a political point of view, but almost really from uh, something much more profound. So, what was your experience? And what are you thinking in these terms, since you really had the time and the courage to go around and to listen to different people that don't give in one inch from one another, as you just said. So what, uh, what keeps these people together now? I don't know if you, if, you, if, you, if you had this type of thinking. Well, it's not exactly answering your question, but I remember doing a, a short video um, a couple of years ago where I went around the Washington Monument and a lot of people visiting from different parts of the country. And within a few hours, it was before the 4th of July, and it started out as, as being more political, and at the end it, just, it was really 
uplifting, actually, because we asked about 25 people. We had every race, Native Americans, African Americans, we had everybody with every gender, every age, from all, it was really, you know, hard to believe that within a couple hours we got such a diversity of people. But there are common, you know, themes that kept coming up in their answers that, to answer? the questions of what does the Fourth of July mean to you, what does, you know, the country mean to you, what do you like most about the country, and, you know, I, I think this idea of, um, you know, a, a country that obviously represents, you know, freedom and democracy, but also one that, despite its its short shortcomings, is is you know getting better. Like it's it's trying to get better, and, and, and we're trying to work together to get better. And maybe that's not the case anymore. But I feel like, you know, everybody knows Trump is 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 uh, it's not going to always be president, right? So there's always somebody else who's right around the corner, and. People are already looking ahead to that, and people are already saying, "Well, what about the next election?" And then, who are the Democrats going to, going to, you know, have to represent them? And then, you know, if if Trump were to lose, let's just say I, I know that people would be upset who supported him, but that's where it would stop. And having traveled all over the world, I mean, that doesn't take take place often, you know, where people, you know, as as Obama graciously did, <laughs> you know, they 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 respect the, the democracy. And, and I think that, that's going to continue. I, I don't feel like people, because people know that that's at the root of their American identity, is you know, believing in, supporting it, even though overseas. And if they're to go back on that, um, you know, it goes against everything that, that they believe in as an American. So I, I mean, that's kind of an optimistic view, I, su I suppose. Yeah. I can just do one more question. Have to wrap up. No, go ahead. That's fine. My core question is, uh, um, what advice would you give to someone who wants to listen better? Um, mm -hmm. Because I think that was a core that you were experiencing, being able to listen to people mm -hmm. from different points of view. And uh, I struggle often with that, that even in the social media world, where you see those people who say, if you don't like, just unfriend me now. And, <laughs> and Look, yeah. no, that's a good question. To be honest, if I weren't doing this project right now, I, I might be off social media, and, <laughs> and I get tired of it. Just you know, I don't. I'm not, I don't. I would say, yeah, listening is important. Engaging, make sure you do so in the right way, and make sure your intentions are right. So, I find it just better one-on-one, -on -one, in person. Um, if you come in again, listening, asking good questions. Um, don't assume the worst. Don't go in trying to score points or prove, get them to see the error of their ways, you know, um, which we all do from time to time. And it's easier to do on social media because there's the anonymity and there's, there's just a, something about it that, you know, sort of a mob mentality develops and we're pushed to the extreme. So I, I find uh, doing it in person um, and, you know, a little bit of patience and humility go, go, go a long way. I, I think it's sort of, Reciprocal, like once somebody knows that you're that you've encountered them with with goodwill, um, they'll reciprocate and do the same. If they're you know if they're serious people, which you usually know right away. So I would and keep trying. I, I had a friend in D.C. who was just like, oh, she was complete. She's lived all over, but she's like, I had this one conservative in my office, and he's kind of annoying. And I'm like, you got to make him your best friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> engage, engage, and get yeah, and just eat. I mean, it's half the country. You have to know more and he seemed like a you know smart guy so I was like you got to get closer to him if I know we have to finish but if anyone has any other questions we'd be more than happy to uh, to stay and answer them yeah and hear from you too yeah any any suggestions <laughs> um, any areas to cover or questions to ask people has politics become a substitute religion oh yeah yeah and what's the cure to that? I mean, because this is like living in the middle of a moral we, contagion on both sides. We need huh? civil society. Yeah, yeah. yeah more religion, up. but how do we get to there? Uh, civil society needs to step up. The church, the churches need to do better. We, uh, you know, fraternal organizations, volunteer organizations. We don't see them like we used to, and that's where you encounter people that are different than you, right? In church and in, uh, you know, at the. Whatever the, the the Lion Club and all that stuff that people just don't do anymore. Um, so I think that's part of it. I think 
Yeah, but yeah, I think you're right. It has become. It's true also the grassroots because you kind of said that the grassroots people have more concrete concerns. That's right. You also, They're more what? They have more concrete concerns, uh, jobs, oh, uh, yeah. whatever. Do you see this religious politicization also at the grassroots, or it's more of an elite cost of anyway? Well, I think there's too much focus on the presidency and the federal government. There is a cult of the presidency where you know everything is seen through the prism of Don, right now Donald Trump. Every local congressional race, every issue. There was a headline in the Washington Post the other day. You know, another hurricane about to batter the coast. Trump is complicit. So even the weather. Now, there's maybe a case to be made there, but I also know, having worked in a newsroom in the Trump era, that like if you can get Trump in the headline, that's more clicks and more revenue. So there's pressure there, but. Don't make it all about, the president is actually less powerful than we imagine him to be. And how many people do I talk to who can talk for hours about the president and federal, you know, the, the big issues of the day? I ask them who their local, you know, county commissioner, they don't know. But those people are the ones who are fixing your roads. Um, you know, they deal with taxes, local schools, and, and so people need to focus more on local. So would you say that rather than Trump causing a crisis of democracy, it's a symptom mm -hmm. of the underlying crisis and that the answer is for people to go back? I mean, we're all, yeah. on, our, we're all on our phones, we're in our houses and disconnected. Mm -hmm. You can't have truth that's just abstract. Right. It's, I mean, I think Alistair McIntyre, philosopher, I mean, that's, that was his diagnosis, that we've got to reconstitute democracy at the local level, yeah. but I don't think anybody is talking about that. No, and one part of it is local news. They talk about local government, but local news, you know, local dailies have cut their circulation by over a half in 20 years. Yeah. And part of that's a, you know, yeah. problem with journalism, but um, local news tends to be less political, and that's where you get uh, less, less polarized, which is maybe part of the reason why it's not doing so well. But that's that's where you get that, that's there needs to be more focus there. How do we do it? Well, that's another yeah, thing. But I think the journalism would come if the community. You have yeah. to get the community first. Yeah. Then people care to read and about people it. People do. People. If they're just commuting from a community, which is you know, I mean, that's what I. I mean, we we all live that reality. Most of us. Yeah. And then you don't care about your local community. You're not going to read the paper. So somehow it's you know it's almost like the Frank Capra movie in John Doe societies. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got to reconstitute community. Which read some people like David Brooks and supposedly you know there are. Have you seen that? that yeah, the, local, going the back localism. With, localism, right? which is you know a Catholic idea of subsidiarity, which yeah. the yeah. government closest to the people is most effective and most responsive to the people. And I, I've heard it all over too. Um, you know, especially in rural communities. You know, if they're talking about mandates from Washington or Madison, like in Wisconsin, I mean, they don't they don't work well in in rural communities, um, and because they have their own cultures there. So, yeah, I think a return to more focus on local communities, local government, is where we need to start. And I think you know, social media. How often you get on Facebook or Twitter and, and talk about what's going on in your area? No, it's, it's big issues, right? It's big issues. It's national issues usually, or international issues. And so, you know, the same way with, with you know, people watch CNN and Fox, like Mark Lockley, he's like, oh, I go back and forth between Fox and CNN, and he, you know, he likes them both, but he, all day long he has it on, but they're not talking about Robinson County. Well, maybe now because of Hurricane Florence, but, so that's where your focus is going to be, um, because that's all you're seeing in the media, where it's maybe 30 years ago, you had the local news, you had the, had the national news, you know, the, the papers from each, um, and then you you discussed it with those around you, and, and so inevitably, they sh you know, the discussion will turn towards local issues much more. Economic monopolies greatly contribute to this problem also, because they crowd out small yeah. businesses, they lead, to media, yeah. they lead to media consolidation, yeah. and uh, they yeah. lead to, lead to oh. the destruction of local news. I mean, yeah. the, the centralization of power in Amazon, Google, a few banks has a major, and then Walmart has a huge effect on all of this. Yeah, okay. no, that, that is connected, yeah. That's a whole other <laughs> project. Right? On that note, maybe yeah. we'll uh, put pause until the next, the next project that's going to be on Walmart and Amazon. <laughs> I'm hanging out at Dollar General. And there's a lot of those. There's more of those than I realized. Yeah. They're, all they're good. They're good. Well, well, they're taking over, though. That's the thing. <laughs> Amazon, I think, owns it now. Cracker Barrel. 
<laughs> Trump, Trump country. Cracker Barrel or Dollar General? Like five Whole Foods is not, by the way. If you see a Whole Foods, it's probably not the Trump. You see Cracker Barrel. Is. That's, that's a barometer, right? Yeah, Trader Joe's. Um, all right, so I just have a couple of announcements before we wrap up. Um, our so our next event is um, on Wednesday, October tenth at the Sheen Center, and it will be at seven p.m. And you have a card on your chair about that. Uh, Jen Cacciola, who's a sculptor and painter and tapestry maker, will be giving it an artist talk and a guided tour of her exhibition, which is titled Grabs' Garden. And the, the following event, our next event after that, is very special. It is the 2018 Albacete Lecture on Faith and Culture, which we established to honor the memory of Monsignor Lorenzo Albacete, who chaired the Crossroads Advisory Board from uh, the establishment of Crossroads in 2007 until he passed away in 2014. So on Sunday, October 27th at 8 p.m. at the Sheen Center, Professor D.C. Schindler, Associate Professor of Metaphysics and Anthropology at the John Paul II Institute at the Catholic University of America, will speak on a topic that was very dear to Monsignor Alvacete's uh, heart, which is freedom. And he will address questions like, what is freedom? What is its origin? Uh, what does it have to do with human desire, uh, with fulfillment, with authority, and with power? This event is open and free of charge, but because seats are limited, it requires a reservation, which must be made online at Machine Center's website, and you can find all of that information on the card, which is on the other card, which is on your chair. Uh, if you aren't already on our email list, you're welcome to sign the paper over um, on the table there, and. Um, as you, as you know, all our events are free of charge. However, if you are able to make a donation to help defray the costs of this evening's event, uh, we invite you to put a donation in that box that is there being held by Simonetta. Um, and uh, before you go, and thank you so much for coming. And have a great day.